Are you looking to level up your author business? Are you pounding your head against a wall, wondering what your next step should be? Then join me, Daniel Wilcox. And me, Sasha Black, as we haul ass each week in a bid to level up. Level up. Come along for the ride as we delve deep into the business of writing, craft, entrepreneurship, and every level of the author journey. This is the Next Level Author Podcast. Hello Achievers and welcome to episode number 64 of the Next Level Authors Podcast, a podcast where we hold each other to account and track our step-by-step progress as we level up our author business. My name's Daniel Wilcox and here with me unusually again this week is the one and only Rachel Heron. Hello Rachel. Hello Daniel, I am so thrilled to be with you here today. Can't wait to chat. Yeah, I am so excited to have you. I mean, when we were looking for a couple of people to, to fill in the gaps around, obviously, Sasha sorting out all of the launch stuff, I, I straight away was, I went to you because we've had Jay on the show quite early on. And obviously, like, it was from the right as well with you and Jay that the, yeah. you know, this kind of sprang up and became a thing for me and Sasha. So, like, I just want to say, number one, thank you for doing that show because for me, it brought uh, just real insight into what the experience was for you guys going from your jobs into full time authorship. Um, and which has helped a lot in, in our ways and just like the rapport you had just the um i guess transparency and honesty behind you know your journeys as you're going through it just really set an example that hopefully we've been able to to carry on not that that was the intended point of this, this show we didn't know you were quitting at that point yeah well <laughs> there, i i don't think that um i've ever confessed this even to jay but, but and certainly not to you and sasha but um it made it easier for uh, for me to quit knowing that you all were out here doing the same so it's our kind of, it's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault that the writers well ended. Um, but, but the same heart to heart, honest, transparent conversations between people who care about each other is, is who are passionate about furthering their career is what I'd love to listen to. So you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you so much. It means a lot. Good job. Yeah. And how, how are things since obviously all of them? Um, well, let, let's start a, li- a little bit earlier than that. So just for people who may not know who you are, why don't you give a whistle stop tour as to who Rachel Heron is? <laughs> the whistle stop door. I love that. Uh, I'm Rachel Heron, and I have written more than two dozen books. I've kind of lost track at this point. I know that's obnoxious, but I will count it up <laughs> at some point, and then I will immediately forget. I'm always, it's not like I forget, I just forget the number. Uh, and I write in five genres I write thriller, uh, mainstream fiction, memoir, romance, and uh, nonfiction about writing. And I am really happily hybrid published. My thrillers, uh, I had one just come out last month called Hush Little Baby from Penguin, but I selfishly retained the rights to a lot of my work um, to self-publish it. And I I haven't told you this, Daniel, but I just got back six books, which is a five book romance series from way back in the day and the memoir that we were talking about before we went on air. So I'm super excited to suddenly be able to put out six more books under my own, you know, big girl self and make all the money. So I'm having a lot of fun doing the, you know, the new covers and the revisions and the edits to make the stuff in the book that I never liked a little bit better. Um, I teach writing. I teach a 90 day to done course and a 90 day revision. And I teach at, I have been teaching at Berkeley and Stanford uh, in the writing departments there. However, as you know, I'm moving to New Zealand Mm. in like five weeks. And I'm currently in the middle of a house that is full of staged furniture. The house has sold the money hit the account. So it's real. I wouldn't even, I didn't even want to talk about like being in escrow until it actually came through and it's California. So it's a hot market and, and we closed escrow. We went on the market and then we closed escrow less than four weeks later. So that's exciting. And I think that's the, I think that's the whistle stop tour. Yeah. So my wife and I are moving to New Zealand for, um, kind of a starting over Mm. just being, trying to be brave. Although that's hard. Trying to be making it happen. (laughs) Yeah. It's bizarre because I've heard you, I've heard you talk about sort of New Zealand on and off over the years through the right as well and stuff. And obviously to see it all come to fruition and be a reality, it's just, it's exciting. It's a really exciting time. It, It, I was just journaling this morning and I, and I realized that if, I ever looked back on my journals, which I tend not to do, it would be so boring because basically every page <laughs> is, I can't believe we're doing this. Are we doing this? <laughs> oh no, we're doing this. I think we're doing this. Are we doing this? Can mm. we do, should we do this? It's exceedingly tedious, but um, I assume it'll get better when we get there. <laughs> That'd make a really nice overlay montage in a film if it was ever to be a film of that. Just all these <laughs> flicking pages of, are we doing this? Oh my God, oh my God. And, yeah, and we how can't are, do this. 
And how are things like? Because obviously, right as well finished. Um, I can't remember the exact date. It's about it must be about a year ago now. It must be about you. a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how are things with then? You still keep in touch with True Jay? Is that still a relationship that obviously is ongoing? Absolutely, absolutely. We generally have a standing date once a month to meet. Although we kind of put the standing date a little bit on hold for a couple. Good three or four weeks while things are shaking out while I'm moving. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to take everything off my plate, but um, I see him. I'm in contact with him. I love that guy. And I never, I never won't love that guy. He's mm-hmm. always going to be my guy. And I love watching him. I mean, you know him every mm-hmm. time you talk to him, he has a new amazing thing that he's doing and will pull off. Mm-hmm. And I, and I absolutely love that. So There's yeah. People that get it done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll pull back into the typical Next Level Authors <laughs> format now. We've had a bit of an atta, um, uh, And we'll do a bit of a check-in. So uh, I will just... Oh, so in terms of... I'm confusing myself on my own format. So just... <laughs> just So following from last week's uh, episode, we had Chris Kane on. And the question was, oh, how do you know Chris when you've done great. enough? Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I just want to let listeners know that from that moment, and this kind of goes into my accountability task from last week as well, which I completed... Uh, which is I have now put in like, a, I spent most of Monday this week putting in a very, very rigid, not rigid is the wrong word, very, very thorough to-do list um, for myself because I just didn't, I I had the whiteboard and I had bits of paper everywhere and I've now created a system that my main task now is just to keep on top of and make sure that I'm logging stuff. But one thing that I love that Chris said was that she keeps a done list of things. So right. once you've got your to-do list, you've got have one, it. There I you have go. one right here and it's called the ta-da list instead and, of the to-do it's yes. the ta-da. <laughs> I love it. And yeah, I've, I've made one now. And it, it really does change how, how you see the work you've done. Because I was the guy that always got to the end of the day and was like, oh, I feel like I've done nothing, even though I've been working all day. And seeing this list of just, I mean, literally dozens of checkpoints of different things um, does help sort of shape how much you feel you can get done in a day and helps you just adjust what you're then going to do the following day. And it's, it's already had a big impact on, on my week and it's only been about four days. So my problem always is I will start a system and then it will just fall off. Like I will just jump off that bandwagon. So I'm really, really going to try to stick with it for at least a month, see if I can keep in that rhythm. Cause I know it's about building the habit and everything else. Um, but yeah, hopefully fingers crossed that will, that will keep me a bit more productive. I, I love a new plan. Have you ever done the Clifton strengths coaching with Becca Syme? I've done, yeah, I've done some of the mini sessions, but do you know, okay. Do you know where your achiever must be pretty in your top 10? My achiever, I think is number four. Yeah. 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 It's obvious. Um, But, but I was chatting with one of the, I hope you don't mind if I just share this quickly. Go for it. Yeah, Um, I was chatting with one of our coaches, Ellie uh, recently. And she pointed out that, yeah, yeah, she's great. She's, Mm -hmm. she really kind of gave me this huge light bulb moment. She says, your achiever is so high and you love these plans. Um, and she says, do you get energy from making the plans? And I said, of course. Oh my God. I love to make a new plan. I love to make a new list. Um, but I, Oh, I never achieve them. You know, I just always fall off, you know, the, the, the wagon. And she says, well, she was looking at some other places in my, I want to almost want to say chart, like it's a horoscope, but, um, (laughs) in my, in my list. And she's like, but you don't necessarily get the energy pennies, the energy from completing things. So just let yourself do that. And I have been letting myself plan to the nth degree. And I've never really beat myself up when I don't hit things. I'm just like, mm. okay, all right. I'll ma- I get to make a new plan tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, if that yeah, helps. Yeah, it's, it's funny thing that worked. The big thing that hit me in my coaching with, with her was um, I was asking basically about how to build these systems because I do quite a lot, Yeah. Um, which obviously then makes it very difficult to try and create some kind of clean system. And the thing that she came back with was saying that because my focus is relatively high, focus is a one goal strength. So rather than, you know, diversifying Uh, all these big goals and trying to do all these things that help you get to those, it's pick the thing and then align all the things with that thing. And it just makes that system easier. So that's uh, part of the reason I did this. And um, it just, I I love those light bulb moments where someone just says something to you and immediately you're like, ah, the world makes sense again. Oh, (laughs) that's beautiful. Yeah, she was fantastic. Oh, I I have very low focus. So yeah, I could do all the things (laughs) just fine. (laughs) Okay, go back on. Well, let's go back on your uh, your route. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's what's something that you've enjoyed this week? I uh, can I can I do two things because they're related. Oh hell yeah! Um, I have I have I'm one of those people who will buy you know, like I'll splurge on a four hundred pair of four hundred dollar pair of shoes, but I'll wear the ten dollar leggings until they're you know just holes. It doesn't doesn't make any sense. But I've had this Kindle 
that has got to be, it's just one of the oldest Kindles ever. And it mm. barely started. So I got a new Kindle and I sprung for the Oasis, Ooh, um, nice. which is really lightweight. It's got a little bit of a bigger screen and it has a warmth setting you can set up so you can actually look at it in the bed and it's not as bright, but you can still read it. So it's, mm. It's a bit better than the paper white in that. Um, and on that, I have been reading this really fantastic book that I found when I was doing market research for a book that I plan to bring out, right? I was doing the market research, looking at the titles, looking at the covers. And then I thought, oh my God, look at this one. Everybody loves it. There's so many reviews. It's incredible. So I thought I'll just buy it and see what she did. I can't do it, what she did, which is great because that's her. She did it. Um, <laughs> it's, called, it's called Joyful. The Surprising Power of Ordinary Things to Create Extraordinary Happiness by Ingrid Lee. And the thing about this book is that she has this premise, which says, you know, we all, we all say that we need to find the happiness in ourselves and, you know, being content with yourself. But actually, the science shows that being surrounded by things um, that are particular actually make us happier. Like being surrounded by bright, bright color, look at your gre bright green room behind you, make <laughs> us happier. Wearing brighter clothes make us happier. Being surrounded by abundance scientifically makes us happier. It's like the literal kid in the candy store. Our brains as humans have been trained when confronted with abundance, because we lived, you know, on the plains for so long, hunting and gathering that when you are confronted with abundance, you must take it all in because you might have to go into a fast next week, right? Mm -hmm. So our brains really do get happy when surrounded by the abundance of colors and candies and all of these other things in this book. It's not just about color and candy, but <laughs> it has really allowed me to introduce, you know, you're looking at me in a black shirt, but I've been wearing more colors and, and experimenting with things. And it's just really a wonderful, joyful book. And it's about finding joy in design around you rather than inside yourself. I love that. It's so I mean, your, your environment does play such a massive part in just how you feel on a day to day, even when it comes yeah. down to like how messy or tidy your, yeah. your desk is. Or, you know, I, I do find that if I'm ever a bit skittish or feel like I just can't get the work done, or I'm procrastinating nine times out of 10. If I tidy the room and just clear my environment, like that way it's lifted yes. for some reason. Yes. And our house used to be painted yellow and orange and red. And now for the sale, everything in here is gray that looks white. Mm. Um, and it's been actually <laughs> kind of a, this depressing feeling. Um, for uh, for us, yeah, but I yeah. love that. What, a, such, what about you? What's your what's your thing you've been enjoying? So mine, I'm gonna I'm gonna pimp out um, our patrons and some of the behind the scenes at NLA. So we've got this T-shirt that I designed that we put out last week, which is hashtag Weird Week because I love that. Yeah, pretty much every week on this show, me and Sasha will start by saying how weird a week it's been, and <laughs> I think that's just a trend that we've learned from what it is to be self-employed. Like, there's no, yeah. there is no <laughs> consistency. It just doesn't. Yeah. Exist. So um, couple that with obviously pandemic and everything else that's happened, like every week's been a weird week. So these t-shirts came. I'm very happy with how it turned out. Um, it's, it looks great. Did you design it or did you hire yeah, it? Yeah, I made this you one You did, myself. really? Yeah, yeah I was it's very good. happy with that. Yeah, I, um, I dabble and it's sometimes you just find the thing that works and it seems to have come off pretty well. So um, that's one thing. And then we had uh, an NLA Live Q&A on Monday in which um, I won't name people because I don't want to like call people out or embarrass them, but... I, we went around and we did uh, successes and wins of the month because it's like a monthly Q&A and obviously people were sharing like things they finished, things they'd done. And we just had so many like things that I, I love it when it transcends just the writing and it goes into life and we had like engagements and we had babies and we had all these different oh things goodness. like that people were sharing. And it's becoming such a such a, a great community of people who just, you know, are very open with their journeys. They share things, they support each other. Um, and we had some more people, some new people join us on the call call this month. So it was just it was just a really, really nice experience to sit down. And I think it was one of our longest ones, about an hour and 40 or so of, of sitting and chatting with people. And what I love about that is that people understand Zoom. They understand that they mm -hmm. can type in the chat, you know, got to go. Yeah. Bye bye. And there's you don't have to have an excuse. And they stayed. How mm -hmm. cool is that? Yeah. Yeah, it was wicked. So I do. Patrons, I love you. Listeners, I love you. Um, I'm sure Sasha does too. <laughs> Uh, speaking of patrons, so brand new patron this week. Hello, Nathan Scammell. Welcome to the tribe. Um, I'd say join us on the call, but you actually became a patron mid call and then joined <laughs> us, which was quite fun. But I don't think oh you've had your goodness. shower. I know that's, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't shouted you out on the podcast. So hello and welcome. Um, and then just a couple of quick notices before we go into the level ups. Uh, the self publishing blueprint for myself is on sale. 
Um, unfortunately, I've realized that, you know, the way that time works with podcasts, this isn't going to work. But today is the last day that you can get the limited edition cover for the paperback before I change it to its forever cover. Um, so if you didn't grab that, then you've missed my social media and I feel like you should follow me to catch up on that. Um, also, just to say, Sasha's brand new book is coming out on the 29th of July, which is Eight Steps to Side Characters, How to Craft Supporting Roles with Intention, Purpose and Power. So be sure to head on over to all the major platforms and grab your copy. Well, maybe just oh. pick a platform that you like reading on. Don't go to all of them. She is so good at craft. That's going to be oh. a great book. Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've read the advance and it's fantastic. Oh, awesome. Especially side characters. Like side characters is such a like difficult subject to broach because there's not really much out there on side characters. And yeah. she's done a great job at piecing together what is there and putting a spin on it. Also filling a, filling a space that needs to be filled. Yes. We absolutely. need this and, content. And she did, and I'm, I'm generally not just saying this to plug it, but like when uh, she was writing it and she was talking about a couple of things, I was at a position in um, a book that I was writing where I was a bit stuck and I wasn't sure why. And just literally in talking about side, side characters, I literally went, oh, I've got the wrong side characters. Like they just, they're not complementing the protagonist in the way that they should. Yeah. So it, it's, there's not the like conflict. There's no, none of that sort of like backwards and forwards with them. It's just very, very two people doing the same thing. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of very, very useful advice in there. That's very, very cool. Sasha, if, you, when, if you're listening to this, come on the show and talk about it when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> she she, you, you've been on my show, but Sasha hasn't yet. Has she not? No. no. Oh, and That's I forgot to say, I have, a, I have a, we just keep, we keep talking about it. We just haven't set it up. Um, Dude, Sasha, get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I forgot to say that in the bio, I do have a podcast called How Do You Write? Mm -hmm. And I talk to writers about their writing processes. Yes. Because I, well. I love that shit. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing. Yeah, I'll put all your links in the, in the thing. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, our level up this week goes to Chelsea Felber, who says my May level up was that she received her book cover. It's perfect. And I couldn't be happy with how the whole experience went. I'm jumping at the bit to start posting ads and teasers. Finished my rewrites after receiving my editor feedback. It took me a month and a half to complete, which I, I, was, which I wasn't expecting. But I finished yesterday and will be sending to my next editor today. I basically had to cut up myself off from social media. So I'm feeling pretty disconnected from the groups I'm in, but I did the thing and that's what matters, which I love. That is huge. Doing that kind of re revision is enormous. And yes, I, I always find it takes longer than I want it to. Mm -hmm. um, but how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good for you for cutting yourself off on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I often go through a drought just to get the thing done. Mm -hmm. Uh, comment. So last week's question was, how do you know when you've done enough? And we've got a comment from Kerry who says, this is hard. I'm still trying to figure it out. I think I'm with Dan when time runs out or when I start to burn out. I have major fatigue from assorted medical conditions. So part of my brain says I should do more, but my body says nope. And it doesn't just apply to work. It's also when it comes to playing with my kiddo and what I'm teaching her to make sure she hits her milestones, spending time with hubby, spending time with family and friends. And still, try, uh, still something I'm always trying to work on, which I, I think was kind of the thing from last week. And uh, a name that should be familiar for you, Edwin. Edwin, I miss you, Edwin. <laughs> Edwin says, I usually don't know what I've accomplished until the end of the day. Uh, slash shift when I have a chance to take stock of what I actually accomplished as compared to what I feel like I haven't done. A checklist of tasks done as they sound as they're done sounds like a good idea, but like journaling, I can never make it work. That's the thing that you really, sometimes like the ideas sound good, but it's really just trying to connect with whatever that process is that, that works for you. Yes. I, I must admit with my ta-da list of the done things. <laughs> I, I, so much. <laughs> so, so I, I stole it from a student. Um, I, I, sometimes I look at it and go, oh God, I got to like think about what I did today. And, that, and then it becomes another chore. Yeah. But it's worth doing. For me, it's worth doing. Yeah. I've tried at the minute. I'm, I'm already slipping, but I'm trying to, as soon as I've done the thing, add the thing. That's then, perfect. Yeah. That's yeah. what you should do. Sometimes I do it four days later and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay the exciting part so question of the week are you ready i am so excited to answer question of the week i haven't done this for a year now so yes yeah. play it on me so i figured um knowing what i know about you and your journey and the fact that me and sasha don't really have or don't really have first-hand experience of this angle of things i thought this would be the perfect time to ask the question self-publishing or traditional publishing in 2021 okay self-publishing all the way, all okay. the way. I think I have been really, I've been, I've been loath to ever really say this because um, I love being traditionally published. And I really love self-publishing. I love both. I love both. However, in 2021, particularly, I don't know if you've seen these stats, but um, they're, they're real stats. I think it was publishers 
marketplace came out with this one, um, but I could be wrong. It was normally around 70% of traditionally published book sales are front list. So they're the brand new books that have come out. They're on the tables of Barnes and Noble. You pick them up and you buy them. In 2020, because of the pandemic, it flipped entirely. And almost 70% of all traditionally published books were backlist because people aren't going to bookstores. And when you're on Amazon, if you don't own the book, if you haven't read it, it looks like front list to a reader. Mm -hmm. So they're buying it. So already we have the indie self-published people having this advantage, right? Um, and print book sales dropped so much in 2020. Uh, I did okay with Stolen Things, which came out in paperback last year. But, um, so I had Hush Little Baby come out a month ago. And it's not selling. I mean, it's selling. It's selling a little bit. But it is not selling in the way mm -hmm. that the, my first thriller did when it was in Target. It wasn't picked up by places. And my publisher has been reiterating that this is this is the way right now. Books Books at the bookstore aren't selling the way that they used to, because I think that this is my own Rachel theory, but I think that 2020 kind of cracked that spine of the last holdouts who were not going to read online or, or shop for books online. It got them. They started yeah. shopping online. And, and also I have to tell you, and you know, I know that my publisher will never listen to this, but the ebook so it's in hardcover, Hush Little Baby's hardcover. So it's whatever it is. I don't know, $26, $27. That's a lot. But the ebook is $14.99. $14.99. I cannot tell you the last time I paid $14.99 for a Kindle. I will frequently splash out $12.99 or $13.99, but I don't know if I've ever pulled a $14.99 trigger. Honestly, it's got to be the best book in the world and I have to not be able to live without it, which is dumb. It's just $15. I should be able to pay it for a book. But- I want to pay $7.99. I want to pay $8.99. I don't want to pay that. Um, and even though I know that this is my best book I've ever written, which is great because I always try to hit that when I write a book, it's just not selling. And does and so they gave me a nice advance. At this rate, I am not going to earn out that advance, which means that my career as a thriller art author for this particular imprint, Dutton at Harper, or, or, sorry, woo, at Penguin, Random House, um, is probably over. There could be some kind of outlier. The paperback is going to come out next year. Maybe it gets made into a movie. And then, of course, they'll want me back. But <laughs> as it's selling right now, I couldn't sell another traditional thriller to them. So what do I do? I love that you're asking this question because it's all I've been thinking about. What do I do? Do I pivot? Do I try to write a new book in a different genre or one of my old genres and give that to my agent to sell, to try to sell to New York? Or do I just double down and do what I love, which is self-publishing? Hmm. and write the books of my heart. So do you mind if I tell you my new plan that I've just come up with? Absolutely, like, yeah. Is this, this an exclusive? This, this, is a, this is an exclusive. I, I want, I, and my agent doesn't even know this, um, but she won't listen to this either. I want to write the books of my heart and I'm currently narrowing in on a plot um, and I'm going to write them as as good as I can. And then I'm going to hire my editor that I've worked with for years, my self-publishing editor, who is fantastic to make them into the best book possible. I will then, this is, I'm, I, I'm admitting a lot here. I will then give that book to my agent basically as an exclusive. And she doesn't get to tell me how to edit it, which she's very good at, but sometimes she can make, she can keep me doing that for months and months and months. Yeah. That's not, that's not on option here. She gets it. She gets to try to sell it to an Amazon imprint. Montlake or Lake Union or one of those. If they buy it, fantastic, because they know how to sell books. Mm -hmm. If they don't buy it, I don't want to take $10,000 from a publisher who will then not know how to sell it because Amazon is the only one who, who knows how to sell right now. And I've always been really reluctant to jump into Amazon's pocket. I, everything has always been wide for me. Every book I have is wide, audiobook, everything. Uh, but I'm ready to try the great Amazon experiment. So, so that book, if it fails to sell to an Amazon imprint, I will just happily self-publish and I'll keep chugging along and I'll do the next book and then I'll give it to my agent and she'll try to sell it to Amazon or and then I'll self-publish it and I'll just keep doing that until hopefully I get a book. I really want to try the Amazon self-publish, no, sorry, the Amazon publishing arm experiment. They had Hush Little Baby for a long time and they um, 
declined it at the, like really late in the process when I thought oh, they were right. going to take it. So I was very disappointed. Yeah. Uh, but I'm happy. I've, I've been thrilled with my team at Dutton, but Amazon knows how to sell books. That's Jeff Bezos, yeah. be damned. I mean, it's the devil, but I want to try. So yes, right now this year, self-publishing full freaking speed ahead. I have goosebumps because I kind of feel yeah. like I wasn't number one. I wasn't expecting your answer to be that kind of like black and white, but also black and freaking sort of white. Broad, broad strokes, obviously, because of the pandemic and like what you said about the fact that you know lots of people were forced to buy books yeah. um, digitally. It it does kind of like just feel like spelling the end of an era, um, and I don't yeah. think that you know bookstores will go. I think there'll always be some iteration of, of bookstores yes. as they are, but I think definitely losing some of their power. Um, is, do you think that's, uh, so if I ask you this question in 2023, obviously that's a long way out, but do you think your answer would be different or do you think it still would have been sort of like shaped by this experience and, and where you're looking at going now? I, I'm guessing it's going to be shaped by this experiment, mm -hmm. by this experience. I, I, that's what I'm, that's what I'm guessing. And I hope that by 2023, I have some solid success in doing the kind of, um, focused, writing kind of writing to market i've always written to market in a, in a way but i've never marketed to market if that makes nice. sense yes like i just want to write my book and i want to then i want to use all the tools that are at our disposal to try to get it in front of everybody mm -hmm. that we can like right now hush little baby it's it's already been a month since it's been out so now the rest of the job falls to me forever to market yeah. this book and I'm, I'm not doing a good job of it because I because I'm like how do I how do you market a 14.99 ebook? Um, but yeah, I, know I guess you can't control any of that kind of stuff. I can't I can't control any of the keywords. I can't control placement. I can't control anything. But I know how to do this for my own books. And it's been a long time since I did this fiction wise. I'm pretty good at doing it with the nonfiction. And I have queued up three nonfiction books to come out. Like they're they're written. They just like I have. I literally counted it the other day, Daniel. I have 16 projects on the go. 16. So I'm, I'm taking a, I'm, yeah, and I'm taking a page from the focus book and I'm, I'm trying very hard just to focus on one and I'm getting one done and then the mm -hmm. next done, but they're all in various stages of completion. So there's going to be a lot coming out and I feel like I'm going to just have fun with all of them. And I, and I have to say for any other traditionally published writers listening, it's hard too, because my agent is my friend. Mm. She's primarily my business partner. But when I self-publish something, I'm telling her, you know, I've spent the last few months doing this and you're not going to get any of it at all ever because I'm not offering it to you. Yeah. It's a weird feeling. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, the reason I asked this question, number one, obviously you've got first-hand experience in that kind of like arena. And like you said at the beginning, you're, you're sort of proudly hybrid. You've had a mm -hmm. book come out traditionally last, last month. Um, one thing that I've come up against quite often, especially over the last few years, well, few years last year of um, working with different authors and, and whatnot, is there still seems to be this um, veil over, oh, veil being the wrong word, a lure behind traditional publishing. And it's something that I've never felt mm. because I, I self-published my first book because I wrote a book for me. I just I just wanted to see mm -hmm. my name on, on a book and everything kind of evolved from there. And I've always wanted to, the books that I've written have always been the ones that are the books I want to write and I don't you know I'm well I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to the publishing side of things because I love sourcing covers I love like just being in control of like what I do with it um does that lend you know the book's best success like can I give it as as much success as I want to maybe not always but like at least like I, I get to keep what is me in that book um but then there are a lot of people that I hit up against who are still very very vehemently pursuing traditional deals and I have a part of me that is curious and you know wants to occasionally think well occasionally i have an idea of something that oh maybe i'll put this out to a small press or somewhere to like see if i can give it some momentum elsewhere um but i'm it, it's just a pull that i never played and the people that i do come across who say oh they want to pursue traditional when you talk to them a lot of them haven't actually done any research into like the advances and you know what it actually physically looks like and obviously you have the, the and how long it takes and... yeah and you you have the people who obviously hit the top of those lists and then you have like the mid listers and like there's a whole spectrum of how successful you can be in that arena um so it, it was just one of those things that like it just seemed it needs a bit more light put on it and i i've given a couple of talks at um, the local university about self-publishing and I find it amazing even then that in that creative writing system, everything is pushed towards traditional and there's literally nothing given to self-pub. 
and, and that's I'll, ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous it's it, it is and I, like, I remember standing in front of a class of like 30 people and being like who here has even heard of self-publishing and like a hand maybe two hands will go up and you know by the end of it I don't say like who's going to self-publish but I'm like who here has like is curious now about considering self-pub and you get at least 50 percent of the people put their hands up because it's that it's that model of chance i guess like putting the control into your own hands is can be very, very or much more empowering than putting your, your fate in the hand of someone else yes. but i'm also i'm also very very reluctant to dismiss what traditional has to offer because i don't have enough experience of that and i just without going through that myself i just don't feel like that's a thing that i can speak on which is annoying for me because I like to speak on a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, I say, I say speak on it. The, the thing is that you and I are in this rarefied community that this is all we talk about and this is all mm -hmm. we think about. And you have all of this information, even if you haven't done it yourself, you have all of the correct information. Um, I teach this day long class that is, uh, what do I call it? Um, I, I can't remember what it's called, like introduction to publishing traditional versus self-publishing. And then we spend half of the day talking about traditional and we spend half the day talking about self-publishing. And I will say that usually a hundred, 95% of the people who come into that class come in with the intention of traditional publishing. And I break it down and I say, how incredibly hard it is to get an agent and how incredibly hard it is for an agent to even sell your book. And then how, you know, all, and it's going to take three years before your book that might not even be done yet lands on a shelf. And then I show them my numbers and I show them that for the last five years of being self-employed, I have made more money every year so in my, with my self-published books, which I barely put any marketing effort into <laughs> than I do in my traditionally published books. And I have one book come out a year, traditionally published. And with no effort, I'm making more in self-published because I'm taking home 70% rather than the 8% over here. And by the end of the day, I always ask, so now who's considering self-publishing? And I would say, I, I only ever get like 50% of them, like fi maybe oh, really? 50, 60%. Yeah. There's still yeah. some people die hard traditional, but I will say, and I always say this because there is a certain cachet to mm -hmm. traditional publishing, right? I was chosen. They picked yeah. me. And if somebody wants it for that, go for it. For that reason, I wanted the cachet. I wanted to be able to walk into an independent bookstore and find my book on the shelf and feel that moment of pride, which honest to God lasts one and a half seconds. And then you go <laughs> get an ice cream, but it feels good. And if that's what you want, keep going for it as long as you can handle it. And you'll either mm -hmm. get traditional published or then take your beautiful book and self-publish it and make a few bucks and have a book that is just as much a book. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so passionate about this. This is actually a, a yeah. course that I'm going to be, an online course that I'm going to be offering soon because I, I love talking about this. Yeah, and I think there's so much on it to talk about. And I think you, you hit on the thing there about the whole cachet thing, right? Because I personally, my everything, mm, I, I've always been much more interested in a reader reading my book than like an agent or a house. Yes. Like I really, I, the yes. people at the end of the line who I'm actually writing the book for, Yes. they're the people i want to read what i want to hear from and i know that like it can sometimes be a slower path but i also love the fact that i'm curating and nurturing my own audience that buys into me because infinitely over time that's obviously as that grows you know that you get the whole exponential growth thing behind it like you get more stuff coming in it's just much more direct and i just don't like the idea of having people who are you know in control of the people that i'm trying to reach mm -hmm. or like Even the block between the two even, even something as simple as in a traditionally published book, I don't have a way to ask them to join my mailing list because at the end of a traditional published book, you'll notice they'll say, please follow Rachel Heron at penguinrandomhouse.com. Here's her page. Yeah. They are getting that email. I'm yeah. not getting that email to put in, you know, to put in my list because they want to hear more from me. Penguin is getting that. Like we just have so much more control in, in, in self-publishing. Is there a situation in which you'd recommend traditional publishing in 2021? Like maybe to a new author or, you know, is there, is yeah. there a circumstance there? I would say um, uh, literary fiction is still a way to go in traditional publishing. That doesn't sell as well self-published by a long shot. Um, young adult is still selling well, really well, traditionally published, um, young adult, middle grade. And I and I heard from a, a parent friend the other day. Are you a parent? I can't remember. I am, Yes. Okay. So you'll probably identify that with this. She says that when my kids say they want to read a book, I buy it. It's going to mm -hmm. be, you know, if it's, if it was $35, I wouldn't notice because yeah. they want it. I buy it. You get the book in your hand. And that's why YA yeah. perhaps is still selling from the shelves because the kid wants it. The parent buys it. You get this book in your face. 
get yeah, the phone to, out of your face. Yeah. As little resistance for the kid to be reading as possible. <laughs> exactly. I don't care exactly. what it is so, if he's reading it. My um my son, yeah. I bought him, we were tweeting him to a bookshop when the world opened up again or when Britain opened up again. For one of the first, first things we did, me and Sasha actually took oh. both of our sons to a, a bookstore and um he bought this Minecraft book, which number one is a reading age well above probably what he normally goes through. And it's very, very instructional based on the game. But there's so many words in there in so many different ways that I was like, you know what, if he gets this and he likes it and, and he does, he sits there at night and he just sits reading the different parts of the world and like the different recipes that, is that make stuff. so cute. Just whatever they're interested in, just feed it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's great for traditional. Um, those are the two that jump out at me that, that are, that are definitely still probably better served by a traditional approach. Okay. I kind of, because at this point I kind of um, would move into wrapping up, but at the same time, I do kind of just want to ask one more question, which, because I feel like since you're here, <laughs> let, let's tap that, that, that brain yours. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked that people should be aware of when it comes to traditional publishing that maybe you think, you know, is very, very common that people believe that might not necessarily be true or just something? Or do you think yeah, it's valid? It, um, Jay and I always talked about this and we always, we always like to talk about the, the truth even though it may, it may sting. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and Jay was the first person I ever heard say this, but when people talk about the choice between traditionally published and self-publishing, it is not a choice. Mm -hmm. You have a choice between attempting to get traditionally published and self-publishing. You get to choose, you get to say, I'm going to self-publish. I'm going to self-publish my book. Here I go. And then you get a choice to say, I'm going to try to get an agent, but the agent getting an agent is difficult going a hundred or 200 queries is normal. It is the norm. Can you handle that much rejection? And then sometimes an agent will pick you up and they can't sell the book. And, and like I said earlier, you know, it's from the time an editor buys your book from the agent, from you, you're looking at an average of 18 months to having that on the shelf. Um, yeah. Not for me. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love the way you, the way you, sh you shake your, shake your head there. And I have students that are just, no, I want my book to be out there. I've spent so long on this. I've worked so hard on it. I want it to be read and I don't want to wait. And I, and I want to take the reins in my own hands. Um, but I, yeah, no, I think that's the only thing I would add is that you don't get just get to choose, but you do get to be clear eyed um, and decide what you want to try first. And yes. it's absolutely fine. There, there I think there's, um, this is something we haven't talked about. I think there's no stigma anymore at all when it comes to approaching an agent um, if you have some self-published books behind you. Because people used to ask me that a lot. Like, well, if I self-publish this one, can I try to get an agent with the next one? And, you know, 15 years ago, no, no. you couldn't. <laughs> like, you're, you are a self-published author. That is a black mark against you. Now it's assumed. Now they're going to look up your sales. Yeah. You know, they're going to, they're going to see, look at your rank in the store to see if they want to look at you. That is interesting to them. So self-publish this one, try for traditional on the next one, if you want. More options for people. Yeah. There's so many options. I love it. Okay. My option is self-publishing. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine is through and through. Yeah. Like, like I say, there've been a couple of little bits of, oh, I'd be nice to, to put it out. But then I have, I have a friend that's done, that's done that himself. And I'm watching him go through like 18 months, like you say, of, yeah. you know, waiting for things to happen when I've published like three or four books in that time. And I'm like, and you get no say over the title and it's always, <laughs> it always changes. I think over all of those, all of probably, I think probably 15 of those are traditionally published. Um, I, I got one title. I picked one title and the others were wow. all changed. It's not even by your editor. It's by sales and marketing because they decide what kind of titles are selling. Mm -hmm. Now you don't get to say over your cover. You might, you might get to say, I hate it. And they'll say, Okay, we'll tweak it a little bit, but that's it. So yeah. yeah. There you go. Asked and answered. Okay, so <laughs> how are we leveling up our business this week? Obviously, you're not going to be here next week, but is there anything you want to declare to achieve in the next week? Yes, and it's a big one. I want to finish this audiobook narration of the 10th year re-release of my memoir, Life in Stitches, that I um, told you before we started the show, because this the house is empty. I have an empty closet. So I lined it in blankets and it's just the best little booth. And then when we are in our two week quarantine in New Zealand, I will edit all the recordings then. But I really love doing audiobooks. So um, so that's fun. Yeah, so I'm trying to get that done in a week. That'll, there you go. that'll we'll be, be chasing you up. <laughs> Thank you. How about you? What's your level up? So um, one of them is going to be to stick to my writing schedule, which I put in place this week because um, I'm 
terrible with taking time off and I have a two week period coming up with my son over the summer holidays in which I'm going to be looking after him. So I want to make sure that I'm present for that. Um, oh. I have also just booked a camping trip, which is awesome because it's going to be like my first actual proper week away without child as well in oh how fun god knows how many years so uh yeah i've got that so follow the writing schedule because if i don't then that ruins everything else um i'm gonna start getting really deep into my edits on my horror serial and um, when winter comes um just because i really want to start getting that moving along uh i'm also at the minute working on transferring books because i i've got I, over you know the six years since i've been publishing somehow i've gotten onto like three different kdp dashboards so i'm trying to bring everything together so that i can you know look at reports and yes. things properly so that'll be um for next week i'll work on transferring them because some of that is out of my hand so i don't want to say i'm going to complete it it's some of it i don't even know how you would go about doing that that sounds difficult i'm playing around with it i'm using my lowest well not lowest my least reviewed book to test so essentially i'm publishing the ebook on that dashboard publishing the ebook on the new dashboard and then requesting the reviews to copy across by ah, the ASIN yeah. tracks and then bringing the yeah. back over after. So I feel like it's going to be quite a messy process. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a tip for you, people. One KDP <laughs> dashboard. Please. That's all you need. Yes. Oh my God. That is with all, even, even your secret, secret pen names, they can all be under that one. Yes. Because no one sees the behind the scenes. Exactly. Um, and our audience question of this week is self-publishing or traditional publishing in 2021. Just share your thoughts with us, where you're at, where you think you need to go. And obviously based off this con um, conversation, whether that's changed. And I, I bet you're not going to get a lot of people say, well, I am 100% traditional publishing now. It'll be interesting. <laughs> I know there are a few people um, in the group that are very trad pub um, or at least yeah. pursuing it, but they've considered self-pub. So we'll see. We'll see how that comes out. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us. I really, really do appreciate your time. It is always a delight talking to you, Daniel. Hello to Sasha and to all your listeners. And yeah, and have everybody else, um, if you're interested in listening about the process of other writers, come join me on How Do You Write? Check it out. I'm on there. Check that one out. Yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great episode. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. No worries. Thank you, Rachel. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. Hungry for more? If you enjoyed this podcast, you can hear more of my angelic accent and Dan's dulcet tones on our other podcasts. For more of me, check out the Great Writer Share podcast. For more of me, listen to the Rebel Author podcast. We'll be back next week holding each other to account as Dan and Sasha become next level authors. authors.